West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com A new polling shows a swing back toward Democratic candidates ahead of November's midterm elections. It is the latest survey from NPR, PBS NewsHour and Marist. 48 percent of voters say if the midterms were held today, they would more likely to vote for the Democratic candidate. 41 percent say they would vote Republican. That's a one point increase for Democrats since last month and overall a 10 point swing from April when 47 percent said they would back the Republican candidate. In the same new poll, 55 percent of all voters say they oppose the court's decision to overturn Roe, although the majority of Republicans say they support the ruling. I, yeah. I want to see a poll of Republican women. Yeah, well, you know, you know um, it, it is uh, it's it's not uh, it, it's not as as wide of a gap as Democrats might believe. Uh, I, I think the majority of Republican women uh, probably support the ruling. But but, you know, Willie and, and we can love to get everybody else's insight on this. But but there's a trade off here and it really does depend on, on who is inspired to go out uh, for turnout, but there's going to be a trade-off. Uh, this is, uh, Donald Trump hates this uh, privately, and he's complaining about it privately because this will hurt him, this will hurt Republican candidates in the very areas that cost him the election in 2020, in the suburbs. We always talk about the northern, the, the, the suburbs of North Atlanta, the Philly suburbs, suburbs, uh, you know, the I-4 corridor, which of course Republicans uh, did fairly well in. But those suburban areas are areas that Republicans have been losing uh, over the past several years, the suburbs. And this is only going to cause especially women in the suburbs to move away from them more. On the other side, you have Hispanic voters who have long been uh, more traditionally pro-life uh, than a lot of Democrats have given them credit for. You may have a break uh, towards Republicans on that side of the margin. And then, of course, as always, there's a split uh, in education, college grads people with post-grad degrees, they're going to move toward the Democrats after this ruling, if you believe the polling. And those with high school degrees, those who really form the backbone of, of a lot of Republican surge over the past 20, 30 years, they're going to most likely, if you believe the polls, move to Republicans. So I don't think it's clear cut. I, I, I will say Something's happened over the past two, three months, yeah. uh, and maybe it's the, the the gun debate, maybe it's the leaked memo that in several polls have shown Democrats picking up ten points uh, in the generic ballot test. This is a this is a little tighter than some of uh, some of the ones that I've seen, uh, but 
there are some others that show Democrats surging as much as 10 points. Yeah, if you think about what's happened in that time as we look down, and we should be clear that this does not include the last week when the Roe decision officially came down. But as you said, we heard the leaked memo. We saw the details of it. We assumed that this was going to happen. So maybe you can factor that in to Democrats' increased enthusiasm with the January 6 trials, of course, that come within this poll. And then, as you said, the gun debate as well. So Gene Robinson, this Roe versus Wade, as you look at the enthusiasm among Democrats, is something immediately after it came down that Speaker Pelosi and President Biden said, our recourse here is to go vote. If you don't like what you saw at the court on Friday, you have to go vote. Do you expect this to be a galvanizing issue uh, as Democrats go to polls in the fall? Well, look, I, I think, um, first of all, the, first, the major impact of the, of the decision uh, is is on humanity, is on people, of right, and, and right. making that decision. But in terms of the politics, yes, I expect it to to, uh, to boost Democratic candidates. And in fact, um, uh, I will be very interested to see what those numbers look like when they do figure in uh, last Friday, the act, the day it actually came down. Because um, it, it, it was one thing to know it was coming, even to read the draft opinion, mm -hmm. but to have mm -hmm. it just sort of land Friday. Just have have it happen. Uh, it I know that that uh, just anecdotally, people I've been talking to, it just personally hit them really harder than they would have expected, <clears throat> knowing it was coming. And so I I, I wonder what 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 impact it's going to have. I also wonder, you know, I always look at those numbers for independents and um, uh, a, a, you know, Democrat, Democrats and and Republicans um, uh, are not um, well together. They're the majority of the population, but the largest segment of voters consider themselves independent. And if they break substantially toward uh, Democrats, then this could be a very different midterm election from the one that a lot of people were expecting. And, and that's what we're looking at in the polls. And you're exactly right, Gene. You look at those independent voters and see there's some wild swings. I mean, you look up at, for instance, uh, and they're called independents for a reason. You look, for instance, at, at Governor Whitmer's numbers up in Michigan. Uh, she's doing very well, according to a poll I saw yesterday with independents, where Joe Biden is upside down. So, again, they're not as loyal uh, to party uh, as as they are to who the individual candidate is. Caddy K, the question, though, is about in these national races, uh, there has always there's already been this great sorting and, and Donald Trump has done it. The question is, who voted for Donald Trump, who after Rose going to say, you know, I think I'm, I think I'm going to vote Democratic uh, in, in the coming years. I don't know that that's the case. We may be talking again on the margins. We may be talking about these independents. We may be talking about two or three percent. But the question is, once again, whether the Democrats are going to be able uh, to work the ground game enough to make this a difference. So people who are adversely affected by this and fear the loss of their rights in the future, uh, reading the Thomas uh, concurring opinion, uh, whether they're going to actually register, vote, organize, outwork Republicans, get people to the polls and make a difference. I haven't seen a lot of evidence that Democrats are really good at that anymore. I think you're right, Joe. Um, and we're probably only talking about the margins and we're probably only talking about a few districts and only a few states. I spent the last month traveling around the country and the only thing people are talking about when I ask them what they're going to vote on in the midterms is five dollars a a gallon for gas. Uh, and that was even the case over the course of this weekend. I was in Pennsylvania during the weekend and when the ruling came out and I spent the time talking to an, ab an abortion provider, um, a doctor who actually said, look, there's a potential that this galvanizes the other side too in a state like Pennsylvania. Yes, it might galvanize some Democrats. It may persuade some independents to get out and vote Democratic. But make no mistake that it's going to be a galvanizing factor on the right as well because they see a state like Pennsylvania and they look at the gubernatorial race there and the chance that Pennsylvania, if a Republican wins the governor's mansion in November, could also ban abortion. And you'll get... Uh, you'll get pro-life conservatives turning out to vote in bigger numbers too. So it could galvanize people on both sides. Uh, Democrats are certainly hoping that come November, this boosts their numbers in critical districts and critical stakes. Uh, 
at the moment, my reading from traveling around the country is that the economy is trumping everything. And in November, mm. is there still the momentum there? Even though over the course of this weekend, we heard the outrage. We heard uh, men, women, families, uh, everybody, all Democrats turning out uh, appalled and, and saying that they will vote on this. But it's the only option Democrats have, right? They have to say they're going to get turn out up because other, what else do they have to run on? What else do they have to say about this? It is Tuesday, the 28th of June of 2022, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef. And our daily special is Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays, a small, scant dash. A mere pinch of hot smoked Hungarian paprika will make all the difference in the world. Uh, need to apologize right at the top for David's show not broadcasting today. We still don't know what is going on. The auxiliary stream that we have set up for David to come in to the mothership broadcaster was not connecting. So we put the PB channel on and uh, the brakes still come on automatically for David's show. And then uh, his URL uh, comes up briefly and then the PB channel takes over. But apologize for that. I don't know what's going on. Tom's a bit busy at the moment, and he'll look into it in a bit. So we will find out. Uh, it's either NiceCast, DigitalOcean. We're trying to figure out who and where the issue is. But we will. Yes, we will. So uh, with that said, it caused the uh, morning to be rather hectic shall we say so the uh prep for this show was uh you know not so prepared uh oh <laughs> which means that instead of a lot of ranting uh we may have to just go ahead and abbreviate that and we're hoping that we don't abbreviate much we may have to have a few extra long clips but uh you know that's how it goes or breaks is what i mean to say Anyway, a little discombobulated. Uh, looking forward to the hearing today, the mysterious uh, J6 hearing that on the fly yesterday said they said uh, we're going to have a hearing today and no one was expecting it. And it looks like it is a Pence aide who was an intern at the time. She could be the John Dean in this hearing. Uh, I think and from what I hear is that the death threats before he, you know this was announced uh, part of the reason why they had such mystery surrounding it is for the safety of the witness I, isn't that weird that these witnesses are being literally threatened with bodily harm violence by one party one party and that party has uh, the scotus in their pocket apparently What's up with that? I mean, Roe v. Wade, and now you can pray in school. <laughs> they say that uh, they are more moral than us. What are they, a royal court? Is Alito a king? <laughs> My God. He'd like to be, but uh, actually I think he'd be happy just being the Grand Inquisitor because he is a Torquemada. All right. I refuse to be a sub to these furry doms. All right. They're all furries. You can tell. Freaks. Except uh, the three that are liberals and they, you know, pretty mundane in terms of their kink, I bet. Okay. So, in other words, everything that the founders founded this nation on is being torn asunder because it looks like there's been a Brit invasion that never gave up. Royalists are back in power. Back in power now. Boy. Ugh. All right. Well, they may be in for a world of hurt. This may have energized the United States of America. The sleeping giant has been roused from its slumber. Uh -huh. 
And as Mika said at the top of the opening clip, I'd like to see a poll of just Republican women to see what they think about this. Because I think there's a lot of suburban women wondering what the hell. They're now saying that we should just be barefoot and pregnant. I don't think that's going to make a lot of them happy. Some will. Some will. Because the patriarchy is that strong. All right. Let's uh, just go ahead, like I said, and abbreviate uh, this opening rant and get right into what is curated for you today in this fabulous Terrytown Charter Tuesdays. On the rest of the menu here, after that opening clip, of course, the Trump's special purpose acquisition company faces a grand jury investigation. That's the one that's uh, back in his truth social. Planned Parenthood sued Idaho over its trigger abortion ban and Facebook has begun removing posts offering birth control and the morning after pill which are both legal okay after the break we move to the chef's table where a Swiss court fined Credit Suisse for facilitating a cocaine cash laundering scheme And a Paris court found the French government guilty of wrongful negligence in the use of a banned pesticide in the French Caribbean islands. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. at netrootsradio.com to the right of the page is the chat room link and the chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln thank you Kelly to the left of that chat room link across the page near the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com is the link to our Patreon page please become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio because we pay our bills and we need your help to be able to do that and I should assure you I checked All the bills are paid to all of our various service providers that bring you this powerhouse of resistance. So we're still trying to ferret out what went on. uh, And hopefully it'll be fixed right away. And uh, but that said, your generosity allows us to be able to get those bills paid so that we can fly under the radar and bring this powerhouse of resistance to the fore, especially now since we have to have since we seem to have some kind of crystal fascist takeover of the United States of America and the Supreme Court, the royal court seems to be leading the way in that effort. Okay. Well, they seem to be. <laughs> Because I think someone's paid them off. At least six of them. So anyway, thank you for your generosity in allowing us to fulfill our civic duty as the founders originally intended really a long, long time ago. And I got to tell you, radio, computers, airplanes, none of that is in the Constitution. Weird, huh? If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, do so at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that. Thank you, Tom. Follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's 10 minutes before showtime. And then I scramble to get that linked up on social media like Twitter. And the show notes and links, of course, are where the real reportage can be found. So look for those show notes and links. Follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West. And pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes. Really, wherever podcasts can be found. And, of course, now the uh, deep archive of the Netroots Radio Library can be found at the Internet Archive at archive.org. This first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is out of the Washington Post. 
by Aaron Gregg. The company that plans to merge with Donald Trump's social media company has received subpoenas from a federal grand jury, a setback that could complicate Trump's plans to bring his company to the public park markets. The company known as Digital World Acquisition Corp. revealed the subpoenas in an SEC filing dated on June 24th and warned they, quote, could materially delay, materially impede, or prevent consummation, end quote, of the deal. If the combination goes through, Trump's business could gain access to more than one billion committed by investors. The grand jury is at least the third investigative entity to scrutinize Trump's special acquisition company, otherwise known as an SPAC. After the SEC and the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority opened investigations of their own, Digital World Acquisition did not immediately respond to a request for comment. The Trump SPAC was flooded with cash soon after launch, but its price has plunged since the app debuted. It slid 9.6% Monday to close at 25.15 cents. By comparison, it was trading above 97 in early March. Now, according to the filing, the grand jury requested some of the same docs that were sought by the SEC. They include information about communications with or about multiple individuals and information regarding a Miami-based investment firm called Rocket One Capital. Also, the company announced the resignation of a DWAC executive who is described as an executive from Rocket One. Rebecca Boone of the Associated Press brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. A regional Planned Parenthood organization is suing Idaho over its trigger law abortion ban, contending the ban violates Idaho's residents' rights under the state constitution and that it is so vague that physicians will not know when they can legally help patients who are miscarrying or facing medical emergencies. Dr. Caitlin Gustafson, an abortion provider, joined with Planned Parenthood Great Northwest, Hawaii, Alaska, Indiana, Kentucky, in the lawsuit filed in the Idaho Supreme Court yesterday. Monday, the Planned Parenthood organization operates two reproductive health care clinics in Idaho, and is in the process of opening another just over the state line in Ontario, Oregon. It is abhorrent that we now have entered an era where the delivery of safe, essential health care will be criminalized, Gustafsson said in a press release. Physicians take an oath to provide the care patients need to keep them safe, so we cannot stand by while the government intrudes on this deeply personal and complex medical decision. The Idaho law passed in 2020 makes it a felony punishable by up to five years in prison for anyone to perform or attempt to perform an abortion. The law says health care providers can attempt to defend themselves against criminal charges by saying that the abortion was necessary to prevent the death of the pregnant person or that the pregnant person showed them a police report alleging rape or incest. The law also requires physicians to use the medical method that provides the best opportunity for the unborn child to survive. Specifically, the Idaho trigger law requires a judgment from the U.S. Supreme Court, 
which followed the court's Friday's opinion and allows time to allow requests for a potential rehearing. It's not clear when the court will issue its judgment, but it is expected fairly soon, starting the clock on Idaho's trigger law. Planned Parenthood is asking the state's highest court to put the case on a fast track so that it can hear arguments and issue a decision before mid-August. The Idaho Attorney General's office did not immediately respond to a request for comment, and Idaho Attorney General Lawrence Wasden generally declines to comment on pending litigation. Sites of the Associated Press brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Facebook and Instagram have begun promptly removing posts that offer abortion pills to women who may not be able to access them following the Supreme Court decision that stripped away constitutional protections for the procedure. Such social media posts ostensibly aimed to help women living in states where pre-existing laws banning abortion suddenly snapped into effect on Friday. Memes and status updates explaining how women could legally obtain the pills in the mail exploded across the social media platforms. Some even offered to mail the prescriptions to women living in states that now ban the procedure. Almost immediately, Facebook and Instagram began removing some of those posts, just as millions across the U.S. were searching for clarity around abortion access. General mentions of abortion pills, as well as posts mentioning specific versions such as Mifepristone and Misoprostol, suddenly spiked on Friday morning, and uh, by Sunday, uh, the count had been over 250,000 such mentions. The AP re- obtained a screenshot on Friday of one Instagram post from a woman who offered to purchase or forward abortion pills through the mail minutes after the court ruled to overturn the constitutional right to an abortion. Instagram took it down within minutes. Vice Media first reported on Monday that Meta The parent of both Facebook and Instagram was taking down posts about birth control and the morning after pills. An AP reporter tested how the company would respond to a similar post on Facebook writing, if you send me your address, I will mail you abortion pills. The post was removed within one minute. The Facebook account was immediately put on a warning status for the post, which Facebook said violated its standards on guns, animals, and other regulated goods. Yet, when the AP reporter made the exact same post, but swapped out the words abortion pills for a gun, the post remained untouched. The post with the same exact offer to mail weed was also left up and not considered a violation. Now, of course, we know that pot is illegal uh, under federal law, and it is illegal to send it through the mail in any state, even the one where it's legal. Abortion pills, and I, it's, they're not abortion pills, um, however, can legally be obtained through the mail after an online consultation from prescribers who have undergone certification and training. A Meta spokesman pointed to company policies in an email that prohibit the sale of certain items, including guns, alcohol, drugs, and pharmaceuticals, 
The company did not explain the apparent discrepancies in its enforcement of that policy because we all know that Zuckerberg wants this country moving further and further to the right. All right, let's get to our break, and it's going to be a long one, I apologize. But when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world, and we will finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. Have you ever wondered what the world looks like from the eyes of animals? An immense world, written and read by Pulitzer Prize-winning science journalist Ed Yong, takes us on a fascinating journey that will transform the way you see the world. Through every animal's unique sensory bubble, we learn what bees see in flowers, what songbirds hear in their tunes, and what dogs smell on the street. An immense world is steeped with science, but suffused with magic. An immense world by Ed Young is available everywhere audiobooks are sold. Why would a normally developing girl stop walking? What causes a middle-aged person to lose their sense of balance? Dr. Huda Zogby has devoted her career to unraveling these puzzles. She shares the Kavli Prize with Jean-Louis Mandel, Harry Orr, and Christopher Walsh for discovering the genetic pathways behind serious brain disorders. Scientific American Custom Media, in partnership with the Kavli Prize, spoke with Huda to learn more about her research. The Kavli Prize is a prestigious honor on its own, but the award holds a special place in Dr. Huda Zogby's heart. Because it recognizes work that I have so cherished. It is work with my longtime collaborator, Harry Orr. And I so cherish the work as well as our relationship over the years. So to me, this was the sweetest way to recognize that work. Huda and Professor Harry Orr both received the Kavli Prize this year for research that has been intertwined for decades. Our collaboration has outlasted most American marriages. It all started when Huda was at the very beginning of her career. She was trying to unravel the genetic cause of a disorder that affected the balance and speech of a large family in Texas. At around 40 years old, affected family members will start feeling a little bit off balance if they're making a quick move. Slowly, their speech becomes slurred. And that gets worse and worse with time. Eventually, the family members lose their ability to walk and talk clearly. They typically die around 20 years later of causes related to breathing or swallowing problems. The disorder is known as spinocelebellar ataxia type 1, or SCA1. It's a family with 200 members, and I started immediately driving every few days to Montgomery and collecting samples. With the samples Huda gathered and the help of her colleagues, she discovered that the gene responsible for SEA1 was located on chromosome 6. But she still had a long way to go. Imagine you mapped it to the state of Texas, right? And now you're going to find where the house is. So we had to really get the map closer and closer and narrow in to get close to it. Time passed, and she finally started getting closer to the location of the gene. Let's say she'd located the city. She also discovered that Professor Harry Orr at the University of Minnesota was studying a similar disorder in the same general area of chromosome 6. I read papers by him showing that we are in the same city. And I was like, wow, this guy is impressive. He's done all this work. They eventually met and started sharing information. But over time, it became clear that they were looking at genes in different locations. By then, Harry had an inkling that his gene is towards one side, let's say the north, at most northern side of the city. And I had data to suggest it's at the southern side of the city. So we're far apart. 
Huda learned a complicated technique to create little addresses or markers on chromosome 6 to better locate her gene. And she thought, why not share them with Harry? So I called him up and I said, look, I made those hybrids. If you want to use them, please go ahead and take them. And he was like, great. So we're communicating. We're having really beautiful, cordial relationship. Huda went on with her research, but she had this nagging thought in the back of her brain. I think there's something fishy here. How could it be that she and Harry were studying two different diseases if both had similar symptoms with a genetic cause in the same general region of chromosome 6. I kept pushing and pushing. Eventually, who would have found a mistake in the data from the family she was studying? Everyone had assumed a group of daughters inherited SCA1 from their mother, but it turns out it was actually the father who passed the disorder to his girls. Huda quickly worked with a technician to rerun some of her experiments. Cataloging everything for all the branch of this family to construct what came from dad, what came from mom. And when we did that, it fell on top of Harry's gene. She immediately called Harry. I said, Harry, I used this marker. It puts it right on top of your gene. We're working on the same disease. Huda was relieved, but Harry was worried. Because back then, cloning a disease gene was a big deal. Everybody wanted the glory to themselves. Harry asked if Huda wanted him to return the resources she shared with him. I said, no, 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 no. You keep them. We work together. Now we really collaborate. Now we're working on the same thing. 15 seconds of silence. And he said, let's do it. When Huda and Harry combined their data, they were able to narrow the location of their gene down to about 1 million base pairs. They slowly examined each gene, one at a time. But then, Huda heard a scientific talk about a disorder that was marked by repeating letters of DNA. I said, Harry, we're not going to walk gene by gene. I just heard this awesome talk from Tom Kasky, and it's these three bases of DNA that repeat. Let's just ignore everything else and focus on finding repeats. So... She and Harry divided their genes up, including a little bit of overlap, and started hunting. A few weeks later, on the same day... April 8, 1993, he sent me a fax. He discovered the mutation in his family, and I sent him a fax. I discovered the mutation in my family. Huda and Harry have been working together ever since. Before Huda submits a grant proposal, she always lets Harry know. Harry, I'm going to do this, this, and this. And he goes, perfect. I'm not doing any of that. I will write a letter to assure the reviewers and to tell them how I will help you. And I do the same for him. Between them, they've discovered that the gene responsible for SEA1 produces a protein called a taxin 1 that causes clumps in the brain and leads to that loss of balance. They've also developed a new type of treatment that improves SEA1 symptoms in mice. It's a rare collaboration in a world that's highly competitive. What made them do it? I don't think either of us really thought about who's going to get credit. Honestly, we just wanted to solve this problem. And I think that was the driver. Also, they were young. I would say most of my good decisions were due to naivety. You know, trust your heart and don't overthink it. Really. Huda says this collaboration has deepened their knowledge, not just of SEA1, but other neurological disorders like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. And my long-term vision is prevention. And I'm excited about venturing in that area and finding things that we can maybe take a small pill for that's safe for people who had a family history of disease or had a risk genotype. Her work with Harry is already being used in clinical trials for treating SCA1 and other disorders. Her advice for scientists that want to follow in her path? Be patient. Everybody looks at me and gets excited because of the big discovery. I want to remind everybody, there were years for each of these discoveries, and that's okay. Huda says, in science, it might take a long time for success to come. But when it does, it's so satisfying especially when it's shared with a good friend. Dr. Huda Zogby is a professor at Baylor College of Medicine, the director of the Jan and Dan Duncan Neurological Research Institute at Texas Children's Hospital, 
and an investigator with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. This year, she shared the Kavli Prize in neuroscience with Harry Orr, Jean-Louis Mandel, and Christopher Walsh. The Kavli Prize honors scientists for breakthroughs in astrophysics, nanoscience, and neuroscience, transforming our understanding of the big, the small, and the complex. The Kavli Prize is a partnership among the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters, the Norwegian Ministry of Education and Research, and the U.S.-based Kavli Foundation. This work was produced by Scientific American Custom Media and made possible through the support of the Kavli Prize. This is Scientific American 60 Second Science. I'm Ashley Papp. Mountain lions are now posing for their close-ups. Researchers based in the Greater Yellowstone National Park area have figured out a new way to identify these cats by using facial recognition. And this method is proving to be a better way to monitor these highly elusive creatures. Mountain lions are just really, really hard to directly observe. They're just so cryptic and secretive. And so we've had to find these non-invasive methods, they're often called, to get information about a mountain lion population. That's Peter Alexander, a research biologist based in Kelly, Wyoming, who led the research project. One tool that researchers like Alexander are using is a camera trap. The traps, which are about the size of a shoebox or even a coffee cup, are attached to something that's along the animal's regular path, like a tree that the puma has territorially scraped. When motion is detected, the trap gets triggered, resulting in a snapshot of the mountain lion as it strolls by. The cameras even have an infrared flash so that nighttime photos are captured without disturbing the animal. Researchers around the world use this type of tool to estimate population numbers and overall abundance of species. They comb through the images, sometimes using machine learning algorithms, and analyze them to identify individuals. But according to Alexander, there's a problem with this method when it comes to IDing mountain lions. Tigers, that's, that's kind of the classic example of using cameras for individual identity because those stripes, they're like a fingerprint. And so a cougar, they do not have any of those really conspicuous stripes on their sides. That's because nearly all pumas around the world, with exceptions of distinguishing things like scars, have light, sandy-colored fur down their sides. The scientific name for a mountain lion, puma concolor, literally translates to one color. This lack of unique coloration on the sides of their bodies means that researchers like Alexander can't usually tell if one puma crosses a camera trap five times or if five individual animals pass by. However, it's a different story when it comes to their facial markings. They're kind of a showstopper. Get a close-up image of a face, they're stunning, just those huge eyes. and There's a lot of detail and whisker patterns and all sorts of stuff. They really are beautiful. So Alexander and his team decided to capitalize on the dramatic facial features of mountain lions. They added a few gadgets to their camera traps so that when motion was detected, a cougar kitten call was played. This noise repeatedly piqued the interest of passerby pumas so that they looked up long enough for the camera trap to grab a face shot. Five independent investigators reviewed the puma headshots and attempted to ID the individual animals. Compared to the traditional side angle camera trap, the new attention-getting device was about 92% more accurate. This work was recently published in the journal Ecology and Evolution. This study is an important step on the path to being able to more confidently identify and track animals in a really scalable way. Snapping headshots of mountain lions also opens up new opportunities to involve AI techniques, like the facial recognition technology used by airport security. This could really expedite the image analyzation process for researchers. I think that's very possible. That could be a really useful technique in the future. There have been uh, a lot of other facial recognition studies done on animals, but it's never been with a camera trap. So that was kind of the unique thing about this study, was merging these two ideas. And beyond being able to more precisely understand how many mountain lions are in an area, Alexander says that this new camera trap method could be used for tracking other critters that lack distinguishing side colors, but have unique features elsewhere. This includes vulnerable species like wolverines, pine martens, and even grizzly bears. That's worth saying cheese for the camera, don't you think? 
Thanks for listening. For Scientific American 60 Second Science, I'm Ashley Pat. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to NetrootsRadio.com? All we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. It doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our NetrootsRadio.com page and hit our Secure Donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our NetrootsRadio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. NetrootsRadio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. Too many big business CEOs turn out to be grifters, ripping off consumers, workers, and others. But the corporate con artists I consider most vile are those who profiteer on people's health care needs. We've had such infamous high-profile scammers as Medicare fraudster Rick Scott, Big Pharma price gouger Martin Shkreli, and the Sackler family of opioid pushers. Worse, though, we now face an industry-wide epidemic of insurers, hospitals, and others that are pushing higher costs onto patients, then systematically pushing those who can't pay the full inflated tab into debt schemes. With bloated interest charges, payments go on for years, and medical bankruptcies are soaring. The most significant statistic in today's avaricious world of healthcare finance is this. Half of U.S. adults don't have the money to cover a $500 medical bill. Thus, as the system keeps jacking up its prices and profits, millions of families are forced by illness or injury into the dark valley of debt, inhabited by ruthless debt collectors employed by the medical establishment. But wait, you say, I have health insurance. Still, ever-increasing prices and out-of-pocket insurance requirements put you into debt, too. A recent Kaiser Family Foundation survey found that 6 out of 10 working-class adults with health coverage went into medical debt in the past five years. Most perversely, health care debt prevents many people from getting health care. One in seven Americans say the corporate system has refused care to them because they have unpaid medical bills and two-thirds say they've put off care because of the fear of crushing debt. As one expert puts it, the number one reason and the number two and three and four reasons that people go into medical debt is that they don't have the money. It's not complicated. This is Jim Hightower saying, to help stop healthcare industry's profiteers, go to ripmedicaldebt.org. Local heroes faced threats. Listen up. This matters. I'm Lewis Black, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute with ACLU attorney Bill Newman. Local Heroes Faced Threats was a recent headline for the Associated Press story about the, quote, chilling, tearful testimony from local election officials to the Select Committee to investigate the January 6th attack on the Capitol and the efforts to prevent Joe Biden from being sworn in as president. Those local officials in key battleground states testified about being leaned on to reject ballots and to submit alternate electors who would vote contrary to the results of the elections in their states. As one official put it, there were a lot of threats wishing death upon me. Congressman Benny Thompson, the chair of the January 6th committee, praised those local officials who stood for accuracy and honesty in the counting of ballots, characterizing them as the backbone of democracy. Chairman Thompson succinctly summarized the threat this way. A handful of election officials in key states stood between Donald Trump and the upending of democracy. Although the January 6th committee has not yet written its report, one conclusion already is clear. The United States has taken great pride in the strength of our democracy. And yet it turns out that our democracy actually is fragile. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the American Civil Liberties Union because freedom can't defend itself. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. 
President Grover Cleveland had a growing problem. The nation was in the midst of a deep depression. Unrest amongst working people was mounting. The workers at the Chicago Pullman Palace car factory had declared a boycott against the company. They were angry that their wages had been drastically slashed while the rents in Pullman's company town had stayed the same. The boycott of Pullman cars threatened to snarl railroads throughout the nation. And on this day in labor history, the year was 1894. President Grover Cleveland signed the law that declared Labor Day a national holiday. He hoped setting a day aside in recognition of labor would help appease frustrated workers. The bill had been rushed through Congress. It passed both the House and Senate unanimously. But the idea for Labor Day did not start with D.C. politicians. Working people themselves conceived the idea of the holiday. Two men with very similar sounding last names are both credited with coming up with the idea of a Labor Day. The first was Matthew McGuire. He was a machinist and secretary of the New York Central Labor Union. His birthday was also today in labor history. That year was 1850. The second person credited with calling for a Labor Day was Peter McGuire, a carpenter. The very first Labor Day celebration took place in New York City on Tuesday, September 5th, 1882. The goal was to demonstrate the strength and the spirit decor of the trade and labor organization. Five years later, Oregon became the first state to officially declare a Labor Day holiday. More than two dozen other states had founded similar holidays by the time the National Labor Day was declared. For more than a century, Labor Day has been set aside to remember those who fought for a better life for themselves and their children, and to remember the struggles and celebrate worker solidarity. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and The Rick Smith Show. you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook at Speakeasy, Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. I do stand corrected. It was pointed out that it is not a Pence aide who is testifying today, but a Meadows aide. You know, the guy that votes in various states, because I don't know, how do they get away with that stuff? Anyway, it is a Meadows aide testifying today, so let's look forward to that. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 56 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting a high much cooler than yesterday, only around 88 to 90, and we were well above 100 yesterday. Quite the furnace, and the wind picked up and caused a little bit of damage, too. So fortunately, we won't have that happening today. Sunny conditions throughout the day. Winds out of the west, northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. They are much more brisk, 10 to 15, with gusts about 30 to 40. Ouch. Clear skies overnight. Lows in the mid-50s, thankfully. Winds out of the northwest at 5 to 10. And mainly sunny skies tomorrow with highs about the same. Upper 80s, low 90s. Winds out of the northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Confirmed cases of coronavirus in Jackson County still have not been updated. We stand since early Friday at 461,025 confirmed cases, and the deceased remains at 549. Let's see here. Oh, grass pollen is rated high right here in Rogue River itself. The air quality index for the region is good at 29 parts per million, and that daytime UV index remains very high at level 9. Barometric pressure is holding steady at 30.14 inches. Visibility is up to 10 miles. And relative humidity is dropping currently now at 62%, expecting it to be much lower later in the day. 
Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that are crowd crowdsources from around the world. London is 70 degrees and partly cloudy. Paris is 81 degrees and sunny. Rome is 88 and partly cloudy with a thunderstorm advisory that may affect electrical infrastructure. Kiev is 92 and fair. Kabul is 81 and clear. Hong Kong is 84 degrees and fair. Tokyo is 80 and partly cloudy. Sydney, Australia is 53 and mostly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 55 and partly cloudy. And New York, New York is a pleasant 75 degrees Fahrenheit and sunny. And that is weather from around the world. Brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that are crowd crowdsources from around the world. Staff at the Associated Press bring us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. A Swiss court said it has fined Credit Suisse more than $2 million for failing to prevent money laundering linked to a Bulgarian criminal organization. The court also ordered the confiscation of the equivalent of more than $12 million worth of deposits linked to the criminal group and opened with Credit Suisse. The bank is also on the hook for a compensatory claim of more than $19 million. That's the amount the court said could not be confiscated due to the bank's internal failures, which the court said had encouraged the money laundering. A former Credit Suisse employee who prosecutors said contributed to the organization's ability to protect that $19 million from control of the courts was also found guilty, though the former employee's fine and 20-month sentence were suspended. Prosecutors said the unnamed former bank employee had helped to execute transactions for the organization between July of 2007 and December of 2008, despite the presence of concrete indications as to criminal origination of the funds. Two Bulgarian nationals were also found guilty of participation in a criminal organization and aggravated money laundering for acts committed. The court said it suspended the sentences and fines for some of the individuals in part due to the passage of time since the crimes took place. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, rester toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Danica Cotto of the Associated Press brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. A court in Paris found the French government guilty of wrongful negligence involving the former use of a banned pesticide in the Caribbean islands of Guadeloupe and Martinique, but denied compensation to those affected. The ruling was bittersweet for activists and attorneys who argued that the French government's authorization to use chloridacone on those islands was illegal as they sought damages for the defendants. The decision is a significant step forward in the sense that the fault of the state is recognized. 
Christophe Levac, one of the attorneys involved in the case, told the AP. The negative side, the court does not recognize financial reparations for the victims. However, West Indians have been exposed and are still exposed to this dangerous product. The lawsuit is one of at least two filed against the French government involving the use of chlordacone in Guadeloupe and Martinique. The first lawsuit, filed in 2006, is still pending before the courts and accuses the French government of failing to protect the health of its people and not doing enough to identify and limit the effects of chlordacone pollution in both islands. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on. And we will meet up here tomorrow for Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we will meet up here tomorrow. Right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théères, des photos de bord de mer, d'un manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, d'un manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver